So welcome everybody to this afternoon's webinar. We're very pleased to welcome Mikhail Stamakis from uh, University College London, who's going to give today's webinar based on the work that was carried out for his Archer ECSE project. Mikhail's webinar is entitled Enabling Distributed Kinetic Monte Carlo Simulations for Catalysts and Material Sciences. So I will hand over to, to Mikhail now. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for the introduction. And uh, thank you to all of you who decided to take some time off and participate to this webinar. So I will be talking about um, our recent work um, on enabling these distributed kinetic Monte Carlo simulations, um, which was uh, partially supported by an ECSC uh, grant. So uh, just a moment, yes. So a little bit of background and motivation. Uh, in my lab, we are interested in catalytic materials design. So the, these catalytic materials are materials that accelerate chemical reactions. And we're talking about heterogeneous catalysts. So these uh, consist of a catalytically active phase, like the metal that you see there, uh, and metallic nanoparticles, which exist inside the pores of uh, some materials, typically oxide materials. And these are formed in pellets that are loaded into reactors. So what is happening during the uh, reaction, during the catalytic process, is that some gas reactants are diffusing from the bulk phase into these pores. They go find these nanocrystals, these metal nanocrystals. They undergo some chemical transformations uh, on the surface of these uh, uh, nanocrystals and they give off the products that we're interested in, which we can get out of the reactor. Now, there are several phenomena there. So we have convection, diffusion, bulk phase reactions, and what we're interested in, surface reactions, absorption and surface reactions that happen uh, on these facets of these nanocrystals. And the question from an engineering standpoint is to try to identify um, a good catalysts for given applications. Now, this is a complicated task. Uh, it, first of all, entails some sort of uh, uh, predictive capability. So we're interested in property prediction. Uh, and then we're interested in modeling the uh, kinetics of these reactions on, on these uh, materials. So then we can try to um, build models for these reactions, screen for different catalysts, discover or engineer the materials that would give optimal performance and finally uh, do reactor and process design at the uh, at this at the higher scales the phenomenological scales the plant uh, scales etc now in in this uh, task what is uh, of interest and of key importance is to have some methodologies that can uh, calculate that, that can predict catalytic rates so one of these methodologies is the kinetic monte carlo approach and for those of you who might be uh, familiar with things like molecular dynamics, which operate at lower, more detailed scales than kinetic Monte Carlo, I just put together uh, this, uh, this slide to just make the connection. So if we were interested in a reaction like CO plus OH, giving this carboxyl species uh, on the catalytic surface, let's say that we wanted to model it with molecular dynamics, we would see a lot of wandering around the uh, what we call the uh, potential energy surface the reactants region something that looks like this so all these vibrations would be resolved with the molecular dynamics method however if we wanted to go to uh, long time scales molecular dynamics wouldn't be uh, the method of choice because because of the fact that it resolves all these atomic vibrations it takes a long time in the simulation so kinetic monte carlo now coarse grains these time scales operates on on the mesoscopic temporal and spatial scale and focuses only on the rare transitions from reactants to products that uh, for example in this reaction these are the reactants these are the products so uh, we don't care about the exact you know the precise location of the atoms as they react to form some product from some reactant we only care about the probability per unit time that such a reactive transition will happen. So this probability per unit time is uh, quantified by this kinetic constant, which can be calculated from transition state theory um, and can be, so all of these terms 
that you see there can be parameter parameterized from uh, lower level simulations. Usually we uh, make use of density functional theory to calculate these things. So the kinetic Monte Carlo method simulates reactions much faster than molecular dynamics. It's a coarse grain method, but at the same time, it still incorporates spatial information. So we do take into account uh, localization phenomena, spatial correlations, the diffusional hopping of adsorbates from site to site. We can also take into account different site types uh, and all the different reactions that happen on the catalytic surface. And this is good because we have much better uh, fidelity in building models than another popular modeling approach, this microkinetic modeling approach, which doesn't take into account this ordering and the spatial correlations. So kinetic Monte Carlo basically uh, is a method that has the best of both worlds between molecular dynamics at the uh, atomistic scale and microkinetic models at higher scales with lower fidelity approaches. So in the kinetic Monte Carlo, we're interested in uh, simulating a sequence of reactions happening on the catalytic surface. So here's a, a little bit of a flow chart that um, uh, summarizes the kinetic Monte Carlo method. We define the simulation uh, input, so we have to define a lattice that represents the, uh, the surface on which the reactions are happening. We have to define these reactions, the species as well that participate uh, in the chemical mechanism that we want to simulate. So after we have defined our simulation, we have to initialize some uh, data structures. So we initialize the state of the lattice. Uh, the uh, queue that holds the reactions that can happen at any time. Um, so this is the queue. We create this queue of all the microscopic processes, these reactions. And then we enter a loop. So let's say that we want to simulate from time equal zero to time equal one second. So the, uh, after we have created the queue and we have calculated uh, using random numbers the time at which each one of these microscopic processes can happen. After we have done that, we advance the time to the time of the first process to occur. We report the observables of the previous, uh, uh, the previous state of the KMC. We execute the process. So this process may be, for example, a, an absorption at site 27. Then we execute this process. So we place the adsorbate on site 27. We update the state and the event queue. So uh, we take into, we change the lattice state to register this absorption event and also the new events that may happen. For example, uh, this absorption on site 27 may now diffuse on sites, I don't know, 28, 10, uh, 36, and 37. So we generate random times for these diffusion hopping events. We put them in the queue and then we go back and we check if we have exceeded the final time. No, let's say we have not exceeded it. And then we advance the time of the next process to occur. Let's say that this is a diffusion from site 27 to site 38 or whatever. We simulate that process and then update the queue, et cetera. Note that, as I just mentioned, time advancement is a random variable, as it should be in a kinetic Monte Carlo algorithm. All Monte Carlo algorithms use random numbers. Um, uh, what is important to notice here is that there is no fixed time step, right? So the, the time advancement is every time is, is random. It's different than the previous time steps. And this creates some complications that we will talk about uh, shortly when introducing the parallel simulation. So this is serial. And uh, as we will uh, discuss in more detail in a moment, in order for one process to happen, some other events have happened before that, right? So there is a causality uh, a relationship between the processes that are simulated by kinetic Monte Carlo. This is a typical kinetic Monte Carlo output. Um, we get information about the coverage of species. So this is for two species, oxygen and CO. The reaction simulated is uh, CO oxidation. So you have oxygen absorbed on the surface, CO absorbed on the surface. You can look at these things uh, in the um, uh, in the lattice, right? So this is one snapshot. You see that with uh, blue uh, we have CO, with oxygen we have the oxygen, with red we have the oxygen absorbates. So we can simulate the placement of the absorbates on the lattice surface. 
Uh, we can also simulate the number of CO2 molecules produced or consumed if we have the reverse reaction. In this case, we go towards CO oxidation. So uh, we have CO2 being produced and we can calculate turnover frequency, which is nothing more than the number of molecules produced per unit time per site. We can also count the number of uh, uh, occurrences of each one of these events. So for example, uh, you see here the O2 absorption events, CO absorption events shown here with these bars in units of uh, uh, frequency, right? So number of occurrences per site per time. We have oxygen diffusion, CO diffusion on the surface. These are very fast reactions and they appear to be co-equilibrated, meaning that the forward and reverse event rates are almost the same. And finally, we have the CO oxidation um, uh, forward event that happens. And uh, you can see that this, this bar has the same, like the, the length of this bar is approximately 3.4 time, times 10 to the second power uh, inverse seconds, which is also the turnover frequency that we predict here. So this is typical kinetic Monte Carlo output. And all of this, uh, this approach, the kinetic Monte Carlo approach has been implemented in our software, Zacros. Um, so this, uh, there are some more complicated, um, some, some uh, uh, let's say particulars to the algorithm that we're using. It's based on graph theory. I'm not gonna go into the details in the interest of time. The point is that this can capture detailed energetic interactions. So when species are absorbed on the surface, they may exert repulsions or attractions so we take these into account with high fidelity models. We can also take into account complex reaction mechanisms. And one of the nice things about the software is that uh, it's keyword based, the, the input is keyword based, um, and it allows you, it has specific keywords for troubleshooting so that you can uh, get your simulation going, find if there is any, find out if there is any problem, fix it, etc. cetera. Uh, this is the website for the software, zagros.org. And it's free for academics, so if anybody is interested, they can download and, and play with it. Um, so part of this uh, project now, the ECSE project, was to take this serial, essentially serial, kinetic Monte Carlo algorithm and try to parallelize it. So why do we want to parallelize it? Why do we want distributed simulations? First of all, we need sometimes, uh, depending on the application, we need to high we need high accuracy calculations. We need to obtain high accuracy observables. So this is because the or one of the problems of kinetic Monte Carlo and Monte Carlo algorithms in general is that the errors of the observables drop with respect to the sample size with this well-known um, uh, law, the law of large numbers. So any error drops with one over square root of the number of samples. This rate of convergence is not very high. It's, uh, it's actually one of the worst rate of convergence that you can see out there. So you need to get a lot of observables, a, a lot of samples, right, to be able to estimate your observable. So one way to get uh, a large number of samples is to have large lattices. So large lattices means more reactions per unit time and therefore more samples, so you lower your error. Of course, somebody can say, okay, we can run multiplicates, this, this can be the case depending on the situation, depending on the application, but not always. And one of the cases that you cannot run uh, multiplicates is if the physics of the problem dictate large lattices. So there are certain phenomena um, like these, uh, um, like what I show here in these pictures that necessitate the simulations uh, to be on large lattices. So, for instance, if you have something like this, uh, so basically this is a well-known phenomenon in, uh, in surface science and catalysis, catalyst reconstruction. So the surface of the catalytic material changes uh, when you change the conditions, when something absorbs on the surface, when a reaction is happening. Now, it has been shown experimentally that this catalyst reconstruction can lead to pattern formation. So these spirals that you see there are a result of this. And if we wanted to better understand these spirals and um, obtain some fundamental insight on why they're generated, we would have to simulate um, lattices with several hundreds of atomic diameters per arm of this spiral. So 
you know, if we counted these, there, there are probably, I don't know, maybe 20 arms or 20 wavelengths in this spiral, 20 times 100. And then you also have to, to um, square this, right? Because presumably you're going to make it in a, in a square lattice, for example. This would necessitate a simulation with billions of sites. Right, so this is the complication that we are faced with. And uh, this is necessitated by the physics of the problem. So we would like to uh, develop algorithms that can do kinetic Monte Carlo simulations for catalysis and material science or surface science uh, with lattices that contain billions of sites. So this is a non-trivial task. As I mentioned a moment ago, there is a causality um, in these events. So it's not easy to do these distributed kinetic Monte Carlo algorithms. So this is one example, CO plus oxygen, again, CO oxidation problem. Let's say we have an absorption of oxygen, another an absorption of CO, right? So the state, the lattice state would look like this, another absorption of oxygen, and then another absorption of CO. And you see that this sequence of events has produced the reactive configuration in which oxygen here is close to CO and they can react, right? So the KMC algorithm, the point is that it's inherently serial. It simulates a history of events that have causal relationships. Now let's go back one step, right? So I put again, we're in step four. I put again the CO and the O that I just consumed, right? So the second point here is that there is a lot of uh, know-how in optimizing the, the serial algorithms by performing only local updates, right? So once we have these two, we had here an oxygen, here a CO. Once we have these two adsorbates to react, we don't need to rescan the entire surface for new events. We only need to scan it through this local neighborhood. This means that if we are to develop a distributed KMC, we have to compete with these highly optimized KMC algorithms that, first of all, are inherently serial, and second, only perform local updates. So they're very efficient. Uh, and this can be done due to the finite range of interactions or reactions that we have on the surface. So how about domain decomposition? We can, if we were able to decompose the domain, then let's say we have a domain like this. Uh, it's a small domain just for, uh, for uh, demonstration purposes. Obviously, like I said, we would like to do this with billions of sites. But let's say for argument's sake that we have this domain, we assign it to nine MPI processes. Um, so these would be the, the serial numbers of these processes. And let's say that each one of the process can simulate in parallel part of the domain. This all looks fine up to the point that we start considering or uh, being aware of the fact that there are domains through which communication can happen. Uh, so if there is, if we focus on this domain here and MPI process four at some point simulates a diffusion of let's say this CO or this CO to this site, which is an empty site, then MPI process four would have to communicate with MPI process five and send the particle over there. So if you, uh, if this MPI process four performs simulations or events, simulates events only on internal sites, then this is fine. These can be executed privately and asynchronously. However, if there is an event that changes something in the halo, then communication will have to happen via messages to the neighboring domains, the domains that share the boundary with this process. As an example, I brought this diffusion of CO from here to there. This event will have to be communicated to MPI process five. Now this can lead to violations of causality. So here's an example in which uh, the, because of the fact that the simulations happen asynchronously, we have different times, right? So at some, point in clock time, here are the KMC times for MPI process zero to three. In this case, we have a decomposition with only four MPI process. So MPI process zero is at KMC time T zero. MPI process one is at this KMC time T one. And then these MPI processes are here and there respectively. And let's say that at this point, we have a consistent history, no problems with causality. But it so happens that at this KMC time, right, of uh, uh, T1, let's say that MPI process zero sends a message to MPI process one. 
right? So this is a message that was not taken into account in the history of process, MPI process one. So this would lead a violation of causality, right? So uh, a particle jumps over from domain zero to domain one, but this is not reflected in the history that was simulated by MPI process one. The solution to this would be a rollback. So as I mentioned, this is too late, right? MPI one is already at the time greater than that, so it needs to roll back. So when it rolls back, MPI process one now has to send some messages that encode undo actions, right? So you saw that previously, MPI process one had sent a, a couple of messages to MPI process two, maybe some other diffusions or some reactions. Uh, and there is a message that was sent to MPI process zero. This has not been actioned upon yet. It's presumably going to go into a queue of messages for MPI process zero. Uh, but the point is that when MPI, MPI process one rolls back, it's gonna have to send these undo messages, we call them anti-messages, to these processes. So this undo message is fine. It's going to just annihilate a message in the queue of messages of MPI process zero. But the problem is here because as you can see now, MPI process two has received some messages in the past. So MPI process two now is going to have to roll back uh, up to uh, this time here. Undo any, send undo messages for any messages that it has sent. For example, you saw that it sent a message to MPI process three. Now MPI process two rolls back. It's gonna have to send an undo message to MPI process three. So the point is here that if you have one message sent in the past of, uh, of the history of the process, there is a cascade of rollbacks that has to happen. Right, so we saw here MPI process zero sent a message in the past of MPI process one. MPI process one now sends other messages in the past of MPI process two, etc. So the question is, when does the rollback cascade stop? First question. And second question, how to keep track of these rollbacks? Right, because it's, it's gonna be a complicated cascade of rollbacks that somehow had to, has to be done in a systematic way so that the correct statistics are uh, reflected in the simulation. So this is a non-trivial problem, of course, and um, it, has, um, it has a solution that was proposed by Jefferson in, in the 80s in his paper, Virtual Time. The underlying principle is that if event A causes event B, then uh, in real time, uh, event A has to be scheduled uh, before uh, event B. Right, so if there is a causality relationship before, uh, between events A and B, then A has to precede event B. So on the basis of this principle, uh, Jefferson proposed an algorithm that can uh, use the elements that I outline here to solve this problem of uh, the large cascades, potentially large cascades, with only using lo local operations. So first of all, one MPI process has to be able to take snapshots because it's going to have to roll back at some point. It's going to have to be able to restore the state uh, of a simulation at an earlier time. And of course, the algorithm um, has to be able to uh, handle messages, right? So this capability of sending and receive messages or anti-messages, which basically are messages encoding undo actions. Uh, this has to be also uh, uh, taken care of. And finally, uh, one would have to execute the message actions. So actions can be either some reaction, like an internal reaction or a reaction because of a message that somebody uh, has received. So these would be in addition to the usual KMC operations, namely the operations that I showed earlier in this uh, pseudocode. So I'm just gonna go quickly um, uh, through this uh, conceptual implementation. Basically, this is in addition to the uh, kinetic Monte Carlo algorithm that we showed earlier. So here is the main KMC loop, right? Remember, for uh, T greater than T final, we uh, go through the action. So the first thing we need to check is if we have any messages pending. If we have any messages pending, we have to receive the message and then if the timestamp of the message is greater uh, than the timestamp, the, the time of the uh, current 
kinetic Monte Carlo uh, simulation, then uh, uh, this is fine. We just put it in a, in a queue. However, if T message is less than the current time of the kinetic Monte Carlo, then we go to this branch. We have to roll back to the last snapshot that we have saved in our memory, which has this time of the snapshot uh, less than the time of the message. So we restore the simulation to this la last snapshot. We roll back the queue of messages. We send any anti-messages uh, encoding and do actions for the messages that we uh, previously sent. And then after we do this, we go back here and we check if there are any messages pending uh, or not. And then um, uh, we can also do the, the regular kinetic Monte Carlo operations um, once we are in the main kinetic Monte Carlo loop. So if, uh, if we don't have to do any rollback, we basically choose between the internal or message processes to execute. So we execute always the most imminent process. And um, we may send any messages if executing a process involving halo sites. We take a snapshot and uh, we go back to the beginning of the main KMC loop. So um, uh, we check again if there are any messages pending, receive messages, etc. Uh, we don't want to take snapshots all the time because these are memory intensive. So um, there is a variable that um, uh, that controls how often we take snapshots. Um, and uh, of course, if the the time exceeds the final time, we have to terminate. Now, this is just the conceptual implementation. There are other things that have to happen, um, which I don't have the time to to discuss. For example, one of the things is basically uh, termination detection. So we may have one process uh, exceeding the, the final KMC time, so terminating. But it may so happen that at some point it's going to receive a message in the past, so it's going to have to roll back. So the termination is not really a, a, a termination. It just goes into some sort of hibernation state and waits for any messages. And once everybody goes into this hibernation state, they can, um, they can terminate the simulation. So this, this is another algorithm that uh, we, we had to implement in Zacros for correct termination detection. Now, this is all fine. So we got our uh, prototype working. How do we know that the algorithm is correct? So there is a very nice property, uh, as we discussed, of the time warp implementation, which, uh, which treats the causality properly. So this allows us to construct a serial uh, run which emulates the MPI behavior. So the way to do this is to, again, decompose the domain and note that all of these operations are now uh, executed by one process, right? It's a serial algorithm. So we decompose the domain for n MPI processes, but this is done at the single, uh, at the serial level, as if it was an MPI run. Then we're going to initialize n random sequences, as many as the number of MPI processes that we have. And we always have to simulate the most imminent event in a serial way, right? So the, the only complication here is to pick the correct random number to use whenever we add a new message into the queue or whenever we update uh, a, an existing process because of some latter interactions or whatever. So the point is, choose, we have to choose uh, out of these n random sequences the correct one to use. So if a process um, is um, belongs to domain one, we have to use the first random sequence. If the process belongs to domain zero, we have to use the zeroth random sequence, etc. So we construct a serial run that has exactly the same behavior as the MPI parallel run. Of course, uh, um, it's, it's going to run potentially slower because it, it doesn't have this parallelization feature. So uh, just to demonstrate uh, what we did to, to validate our simulations, this is a prototype system. It's the CO oxidation again. So we run uh, some uh, benchmarks with this CO oxidation with these three reactions or three, these three events, two adsorption events for CO oxygen, uh, one reaction event, they are all reversible. So this is the CO oxidation event, plus the diffusion events for oxygen and CO. This was run on a 6 by 6 lattice, 
the lattice is quite small, so there is going to be a lot of communication in the MPI run. So this um, uh, creates complexity, right? So if, if there is a lot of communication and we get the serial run to um, have the exact same results as the MPI parallel run, we're pretty sure that we have programmed the time, the time warp algorithm correctly. So here are the results. The uh, coverages are plotted here uh, of the two species, CO and oxygen, with respect to time. This is the parallel run with the time warp uh, in the MPI implementation. This is the serial run, the serial emulation of the, the time warp. And we see that we get identical results down to the stochastic fluctuations. Right? So these are exactly the same uh, profiles. And believe me, it's, it's really two different simulations even though they look exactly the same, that's what validates our implementation. And this is also true for larger lattices. So we have run uh, a series of simulations and we always get the exact same results. Uh, I also plot here the number of CO2 molecules produced, again, from the MPI parallel run, the, uh, the serial emulation, exactly the same results. Note that we have this discrete behavior, right? So at this point, one CO2 molecule was produced then here another CO2 molecule was produced, et cetera. That's why it looks like a staircase. But of course, the random, there, are, there is randomness in the times that uh, CO2 molecules are elicited from the surface. So, the, uh, so this is nice. It validates our implementation. And the next thing that we wanted to do is to check the performance. So I'm showing here some performance benchmarks in uh, relatively large systems. So um, we use the system, the uh, CO oxidation system, but in this, for these runs, we just had CO adsorption and diffusion, uh, uh, reversible events. So we run simulations with lattices of 144 by 144 uh, sites um, up to 900 by 900 sites. So this is uh, almost a million uh, sites in the system, 800,000 sites in the system. And we see that um, uh, depending on the number of MPI processes, uh, we get a deceleration for small systems and uh, an acceleration for the larger system. So for the small systems, 144 by 144, 288 by 288, we see that for uh, MPI process of about less than 100, uh, we, we see that there is a, a lot of time spent in acquiring the snapshots, saving them into memory, uh, going back in time with rollbacks and re-simulating, which means that we have to restore the snapshots. So these are quite expensive operations. And we see that there is uh, a deceleration. So for these systems, one um, would be better off running the serial version. But you see that for larger systems, like the 720 by 720, 900 by 900, uh, these here, we get some acceleration factors of about 100 with um, about, um, uh, what is this, like 200, 300, about 300 uh, processes or above. So uh, we get these acceleration factors that uh, tell us basically that time work becomes progressively more efficient for uh, larger uh, uh, lattices. The, uh, these are all normalized uh, results. So these are normalized with respect to the uh, one MPI process. So there is a bit of a cost, and I'm showing it here. Uh, there is a, a little bit of a cost in running a, a one MPI process run versus a truly serial, serial run. So this is what I'm showing here. The KMC simulation speed for the truly serial run, especially for small lattices, is much better than the single MPI process. However, again, we see that for large lattices, uh, uh, about 500 by 500 and upper and higher, uh, we see that this extra expense, computational expense of the uh, one MPI process run becomes negligible. So it would be the same if you were to run uh, one MPI process run versus a serial run. So again, uh, this shows that well, th this result shows that the overheads uh, become negligible for larger lattices, combined with these previous results that I showed, basically tell us that uh, uh, there is a lot of potential for this uh, time warp algorithm in accelerating these massively uh, uh, parallel distributed simulations. 
So to uh, conclude my presentation, um, the Kinetic Monte Carlo simulation method is a powerful approach towards uh, obtaining fundamental understanding of how heterogeneous catalysts work. We do need large-scale simulations, not only because of uh, the demand for higher accuracy, but uh, because we need to tackle new physics like these complicated pattern formation, these spiral patterns, uh, simulation of these things, uh, the, th these effects of reconstruction truly necessitate uh, large-scale, massively parallel calculations. So our Kinetic Monte Carlo code Zacros now implements the time warp algorithm. This is a first of its kind prototype for massively parallel simulations that this high fidelity uh, uh, approach, taking into account lateral interactions, complicated reactions, etc. And the nice thing about this is that it's an exact algorithm that can lead reproducible and validated output. So it's very nice that we have an exact algorithm because if you are to uh, do simulation for pattern formation, you really don't want inaccuracies uh, or spurious effects of your scheme, the computational scheme, to be responsible for any uh, curious effects that you see. You want to make sure that your, simulating, your simulation is a faithful representation of the underlying dynamics. And that's why we really needed an exact uh, algorithmic representation like the one we uh, achieved with the time warp algorithm. I would like to end with my acknowledgments. This work would not have been possible uh, without the effort of uh, many talented people uh, in chemical engineering and in the research software development group at UCL. So all of these uh, uh, people here, Electra, Roland, uh, Jens, Srikanth, Miguel, and Yanis, they all contributed uh, to this project. Funding was from uh, EPSRC, the Leverkusen Trust, EPCC, and Archer for this uh, ECC project, as well as the European Commission, and computational resources are gratefully acknowledged from UCL and Archer. So this concludes my presentation, and if you have any questions, we can discuss. So thanks very much, Mikhail. If anybody has any questions, then uh, you can either uh, activate your microphone and speak, or speak in, or write something into the chat um, that you'll find on the right-hand side. I'm looking at the chat. I'm not yes, sure. hello. Hello. Um, th thank you for a nice presentation. I was just wondering if you are aware of any algorithms that, instead of working with rollback, try to maintain causality um, at the halos by, take, by somehow considering um, the ordering of operations on either side of the domain boundaries um, and uh, coming to a, um, harmonizing these. Mm -hmm. Yes, so there is an exact algorithm, the Lubachevsky algorithm. Uh, this, I believe this predates the, uh, the time warp algorithm. But uh, there is a little bit of a problem in, in its general application. So we have tried to implement the Lubachevsky algorithm. And this can be done easily if you have um, events which, whose rates are constant and uh, the same. So if the event rates are the same, then what you do, let me go back to my uh, plot of the lattice, just for this argument. Yes, yeah, so if this, is your, uh, if this is your domain, the Lubachevsky algorithm basically says that it's based on the principle that um, a domain, a, 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 an MPI process handling this domain can do something, right, can uh, simulate the process if and only if it's the, the most imminent time is lower than all of the times of its neighbors. So the acceleration from uh, this scheme arises from the fact that this guy has these neighbors, one, two, three, four, and depending on the connectivity, it may also have these things, these neighbors here. But then if you have, uh, let's say, uh, a 100 by 100 um, uh, lattice, with like a 10 by 10 MPI configuration, not everybody is everybody's neighbor. So you may get an acceleration out of several MPI processes doing something because they so happen to have the lowest, most imminent time compared to their neighbors. But as I said, this um, precludes or, or presumes that um, the kinetic constants are the same 
and um, the, they don't change with respect to lateral interactions. There is a way to fix this, this problem with the introduction of null events. So if you had, um, let's say, fast diffusion and slow adsorption desorption, you can have null events that basically um, uh, harmonize everything. So you can have the, um, like a maximum uh, time um, or a maximum, let's say, kinetic constant in which any event can happen. And you, you also provide um, a, a possibility for nothing to happen. So this, is, this fixes the problem of the Lubachevsky algorithm, uh, but it introduces null events which basically um, uh, decrease the efficiency of the process. So, I mean, we can have a more technical discussion, but the, the point is that there is a way to generalize the Lubachevsky algorithm, but it becomes complicated and it reduces the efficiency. I am not aware of any study that has uh, shown how much the decrease in the efficiency is. I'm aware of studies that have done, have implemented the Lubachevsky algorithm in Ising spin systems with um, uh, kinetic constants that are the same for the spin flips, etc., and they can see uh, quite uh, good acceleration factors, but these are for very specific applications. Very nice, thank you. And of course, there are approximate algorithms, but these are in a totally different class, right? So there is there is a class sure. of algorithms, like Martinez et al., that really have a pretty good acceleration factor, but again, these uh, introduce error in the simulation. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thanks. So there's, uh, there is also a question in the chat there um, from yes. KS. It says, is there a risk that snapshots do not go far back enough in time? Okay, so yeah, that's a good question. Uh, there is, so there is one more component in the algorithm that I didn't have the time to discuss. Uh, but the, the thing is that the, um, every so often, there is a global communication event that basically tries to find the minimum time among all of these processes, right? So the, uh, if you find the minimum time, then you're allowed to delete previous snapshots before that minimum time. And you can do this safely because you know that there is no way that you can get a, a, a rollback event before that time. We call this the global virtual time. So going back to the example here, if all, I, I, I think you would agree with me that if every process has a, um, a snapshot, let's say just before the time of MPI process three, right? Let's say here, then we are fine because the worst case scenario, MPI process three sends a message to one of these processes. And in this worst case scenario, we only have to roll back just before this time, the time of MPI process three. Right, so this risk is not a problem, um, and it's efficiently uh, done. Uh, you know, tackling this problem uh, is efficiently done with the uh, implementation that we have uh, achieved. Okay, thanks for that. Are there any other questions? I'm sure if you have questions, you um, you could either contact Mikhail directly, or um, you if you prefer, you can just contact the EPCC help desk, and we'll sorry the Archer help desk, and we will pass those on. And okay. yeah, this, this will be this has been recorded, so that it will be up for you to watch again if you if you want to go back over anything. Yep, thank you, Chris. Okay, thanks. So thank you again very much to Mikhail, and um, uh, I hope you all enjoyed it. So thank you very much for coming along. So if there's no further questions, uh, I'll finish up now. Um, and thanks to everyone. We'll hold on there, just typing, just one second. Yeah, just a few thank yous coming in, so that's good. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay. Thanks very much then. Okay. Bye to everybody. Bye.